I'd like to move without uh, uh, further ado to uh, introducing Dr. Gendron. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have her here sort of with us today. Um, she's going to be speaking about the, uh, the cultural construction of emotion perception. Um, and as you'll see, uh, you know, from, from her, uh, her talk, uh, her work really sits squarely uh, at this intersection of mind, brain, and culture that is the whole reason for the CNBC's existence to promote and cultivate. Um, so we're very happy to have her speaking. Um, Dr. Gendron is currently an assistant professor in psychology at Yale, um, and her effective science and culture lab there focuses on understanding the diversity of human emotion as expressed across cultures, contexts, and individuals. So this cross-disciplinary work employs methods ranging from field and lab-based behavioral studies to neuroimaging, uh, and it's led to publications in journals ranging from emotion review to trends in cognitive science, uh, covering topics from biobehavioral synchrony to emotion perception in hunter-gatherers. Uh, so please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Gen. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go ahead and see if I can get my slides set up here. Okay, can you see the slides clearly? Excellent. All right, so uh, first off, I just want to uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here to share my work with you. I'm sorry that it's not in person, but I'm really happy that we have this uh, back up um, so that I can, um, you know, get the opportunity to connect with you in this format. Um, today I'm going to talk about some published research as well as some newer work. And I'm really excited to hear your feedback and questions, um, particularly about the newer research um, where, where I think we're just kind of shaping these ideas. Um, as uh, the introduction suggested, uh, I focus broadly on the nature of emotion uh, in my work with a particular emphasis on understanding the extent of and sources of diversity in emotion perception. So today I'm going to focus on the ability to bridge minds um, in the context of emotion perception. And in particular, I'll focus on how I view this as a skill that is really culturally constructed. And I'll talk about the ways that we study this skill, um, which are really informed by this perspective. So first, I actually want to situate what we're talking about by beginning with the cultural zeitgeist surrounding emotion. Um, so emotions are increasingly being taught, quantified, detected, and even programmed. And the implication of the types of products that are out there is that emotions are organized into straightforward natural categories that are stable across individuals, timescales, and societies. So if supported, these assumptions would allow us to begin to apply the science of emotion to domains like artificial intelligence and the quantified self quite easily. But we can question whether we are indeed ready for all of these types of applications. For example, are the ways that emotions are exported into these domains sufficiently nuanced and realistic are they culturally sensitive? Accumulating evidence suggests that we may not be ready just yet, at least not for all of these applications. And this is really because we're discovering a remarkable amount of diversity in the way that emotions unfold. And this diversity in emotional instances is perhaps most handily captured uh, by meta-analysis. And uh, across a range of meta-analyses in different uh, areas of emotion work, uh, we find that there's quite limited evidence for clear, discrete uh, neural, behavioral, and physiological patterning of emotion. That doesn't mean that these systems aren't active in emotion, but merely that we cannot detect uh, specific emotions based on the patterning. So we can't merely peer into your brain, measure your periphery, or look at your face and detect with certainty what your emotional state is, at least not yet. Instead, what this science suggests is that emotions are populations of diverse instances. So the proliferation of these simplifying assumptions about emotion in applied domains may be due um, to uh, something else, right? Besides the science that we uh, now have in hand. 
Um, and instead, it may be the case that the intuitive appeal of these kinds of tools, so trying to quantify um, emotions in our brain and our body and our behavior, are also due to the fact that emotions feel very real and very distinct to us. So when you ask people about their beliefs about emotion, uh, generally they'll report that they view members of an emotion category like anger as having a very distinct underlying reality, even when they can't pinpoint the specific features or biological mechanism that makes this true. And this is uh, referred to as psychological essentialism. So individuals believe that uh, these types of categories here outlined in orange um, are natural and share an underlying essence or cause. And this is very similar to homeostatic states like thirst or hunger. But at the same time, people also seem to have an intuition that emotions are messy. That is, when you ask them whether instances of emotion share the same features, right? So whether uh, people will move their faces in similar ways or whether their, their bodies do the same thing, people understand that they are variable. So emotions are also uh, believed to be more similar to socially constructed categories like society or American culture when we think about how diverse those instances are. So this is a bit of a conundrum. What gives emotions this natural status in our beliefs despite all this variability? And one potential explanation, um, at least in part, is that what gives emotions this clear um, sense of an underlying reality is that we have concepts for emotions. That is what you and others like you know about a given emotion. And concepts in this view are powerful. That is knowing a word like anger is not just a, a label to categorize it in existing instance, but it can actually scaffold how emotion unfolds. So there's now considerable evidence uh, from work that I've done with my colleagues as well as other labs um, to suggest that emotion knowledge impacts how emotions are perceived. And in particular, uh, what's often done is um, using language as an entry point to tap emotion knowledge. So either uh, making emotion knowledge temporarily less accessible by having individuals uh, massive, do massive repetition of emotion terms or having individuals uh, primed with emotion concepts by providing them with labels. And across both of these types of manipulations, uh, you can see that there's a range of different effects where encoding of um, facial expressions in particular appears to be uh, impacted by the presence of emotion category knowledge. So together, these findings suggest that words and the knowledge that they help anchor are powerfully shaping emotion perception. Interestingly, words appear to scaffold emotion perception pretty early on. Um, so in young children, we see that words have a preference um, or, or sort of uh, facilitate categorization tasks over other cues. But importantly, concepts for emotion are also pretty slowly developing. Um, so recent data suggests that even into the teenage years, we have this refinement of our emotion knowledge that's taking place. Um, such that individuals uh, start to develop much more abstract definitions of even existing emotion concepts. So they can abstract across the messy instances um, of emotion that really vary from one another. And into adulthood, we know that individual differences in emotion knowledge and use are still present. So as a consequence, we can hypothesize that emotions are culturally constructed phenomena such that uh, there should be variable endpoints in emotions form and function across societies and individuals. And this is uh, based on the idea that emotion knowledge is really constructing um, these instances and emotion knowledge is something that is cult culturally conferred. So in the remainder of my talk, what I'll do is focus on two different strands of research um, that are actually quite distinct, but hopefully you'll see the thread coming through. Um, to in really investigate these variable endpoints. So first I'll present some data from cross-cultural work suggesting that it's harder to bridge minds to perceive emotion than you might think. 
Specifically, I'll re revisit some classic findings on universal emotion perception, demonstrating some of the conditions under which they do not appear to hold. Second, I'll present some work on individual differences in emotion perception. And these uh, individual difference findings suggest that the ability to perceive emotion in a way that agrees with other members of your cultural group is going to be predicted by your active emotion vocabulary. So let's start with the cultural differences. And here again, we're focused on emotion perception. So the standard psychology textbook will tell you something quite compelling about the nature of emotion perception. And, and perhaps many of you um, in this uh, talk um, audience are thinking, isn't this a closed case, right? We already know about um, the way that emotion perception proceeds across societies. Um, so the standard psychology textbook will tell you that individuals around the world will perceive the same emotional meaning in expressions like these. There might be some subtle differences in terms of uh, intensity reporting or um, small differences in accuracy, but by and large, the emotional meaning that individuals extract is universal. So today I'm going to take you on a little journey to revisit this idea really by asking the same question. Do canonical facial expressions like these have universal emotional meaning as uh, signals of fear, sadness, surprise, and so on? So we'll home in on tests that are conducted in small scale societies in particular, because these provide a context for observation where the potential to document diversity is maximized. So what I'm showing here is a visual depiction of the uh, variation in the types of tasks that have been used in the emotion, liter emotion perception literature in small scale societies. And in particular, what I'm showing is uh, just the samples that were conducted in an early kind of flurry of activity that took place in the late 1960s and early 70s. So what you can see on the top of this array are tasks that are highly constrained, meaning that participants are read a scenario about an emotional event, which includes context cues and sometimes behaviors. And then they're asked to select a face that matches that scenario best. All the way on the other end of this continuum, you can see uh, tasks that are really reflecting a more discovery-based strategy. That is tasks that ask individuals to provide a label um, without any constraints provided by the researcher. Of course, the stimuli themselves are serving as a strong constraint here. So what we can see in this early period is that the strongest evidence for universal emotion perception, that is, individuals in these small scale societies perceiving these uh, portrayals of emotion uh, in the manner that the researchers expected and intended um, really comes from these more constrained style tasks. That is when individuals are provided with uh, rich scenarios and asked to select which behavior, which uh, facial behavior corresponds to it. The evidence for um, the free labeling uh, version of this. So at the other end of the continuum is a little bit more variable. And so that's what we'll focus on um, together. But first, I just want to highlight um, a little bit more about this paradigm where you get the strongest results. So um, this is an example of what participants might be read. He is faced with a dangerous animal and looks ready to bite, and he feels afraid. So what um, these early tests revealed was that in the sort of very um, small set of societies that were sampled, overall, when participants were given a task like this, they did quite well at selecting the target that the researchers expected. And so this is perhaps why, right, when you pick up a psychology textbook, um, the narrative of really robust universal emotion perception persists. So I asked a pretty simple question, which is whether classic universality findings replicate in an expanded sampling of small scale societies, including in less constrained tasks. So in particular, I'm just going to give you one empirical example from my recent work, um, showing you uh, what we find when we use less constrained methods. <clears throat> 
Um, this research was conducted uh, in the Hadza foraging uh, community that's located in Tanzania. And at the time of testing, uh, the participants that uh, we engaged were primarily hunting and foraging and still uh, largely semi-nomadic. The Hadza uh, community was selected due to their ecological context, which at the time of testing was closest to that in which certain emotional expressions were proposed to have evolved. Um, that is, we were able to test whether emotion perception reflects the ecological constraints um, that are proposed to have encouraged emotional signaling in specific forms, like widened eyes for fear to increase sensory uptake. It's important for me to note uh, that Hadza community members are not models of our Paleolithic uh, life or past, um, and certainly findings that support the existence of emotional expression or perception in a way that's consistent with these um, evolutionary um, predictions um, could also be due to other mechanisms such as cultural evolutionary processes. Um, but this is one of the best contexts in which we can test these ideas. So we did multiple tasks and I'm only going to tell you about the open-ended one as I suggested, um, but I'm happy to take questions and talk about the other um, tasks that we um, uh, did during this research. In the emotion perception um, task that I'm showing here, participants uh, were given a prompt to label what a target who is pictured uh, was feeling. And they were provided with six different target portrayals. Um, one was scowling, one was pouting, one was wide-eyed, wide-eyed gasping, smiling and nose wrinkling. And you may um, be picking up that these are uh, intended to uh, signal emotions like anger, sadness, and so on. So participants were given um, ample time. They weren't timed on this task and they were allowed to provide a word or even a phrase if they so chose. And um, what I want to show you first is um, how the data look when we code emotion labels that are provided by participants from uh, the US as a place to anchor this task. So um, here we coded emotion labels um, for consistency uh, with those posed faces that were included in the task. So this is in keeping with the traditional accuracy approach to emotion perception. And on the left uh, here, you can see the data plotted for US participants and brighter squares here are referring to high agreement between uh, participants and the universally stipulated category. So what we can see is that the brightest responses are falling along this main diagonal as would be predicted. And this suggests that Western perceivers saw the expected emotions in the target facial behaviors. So in contrast, here's the data presented in the same manner for our Hadza participants. And we can see that the squares along the diagonal are much less bright. Uh, what this suggests is that participants in this society do not often perceive the expected Western emotion categories in these targets. Um, that is, uh, Hadza individuals rarely perceive uh, faces in keeping with the presumed universal labels. This uh, does have a couple of notable exceptions. So we can see that anger was actually perceived uh, to a pretty uh, strong uh, degree, right, in, in keeping with the um, universalist predictions, as well as smiling behavior being perceived as um, a signal of positive affect or happiness. And these findings actually converge with a growing body of evidence suggesting uh, that there is much more diversity rather than cultural uniformity in how Western lab generated nonverbal cues are perceived by individuals from small scale societies. So um, in more recent samples that were collected within the last um, decade or so, what we can see is that um, for many studies, the evidence for universal perceptions is actually relatively weak or not present. So what these data suggest is that uh, these observations of cultural diversity um, are really quite robust, particularly when the methods are open um, and not encouraging responses that meet a particular uh, response style. 
And so these findings suggest that Western style cues do not universally bridge minds right, when we take away all of those context cues. While affective information um, did appear to be similarly perceived um, in other task data I've not shown you, emotion states like sadness or disgust were not. More broadly, these findings fit with a well-documented uh, gap in emotion perception that's present even in highly structured tasks and even in uh, large-scale societies where there's a great degree of um, cultural contact and, and media um, exposure and so forth. And what this suggests is that bridging minds um, is more difficult to cross cultural context than has previously been assumed and that the size of this gap may be underestimated in meta-analytic findings that largely tap these large-scale societal contexts. Perhaps these findings are not that surprising uh, given the remarkable diversity across societies in the emotion lexicon, however. So recent uh, large-scale linguistic comparison uh, in this work led by uh, Josh Conrad Jackson and colleagues um, revealed that linguistic groups, both historically and currently, have represented emotions quite differently. And these are networks that are representing the major world language groups and the differences in emotion semantics that were observed. So some features like valence, so whether someone is feeling uh, pleasure or pain, are strongly shared across language networks, just as they were in our um, face perception data, but the organization of these networks varies quite widely. And this diversity suggests that the findings I just showed you are likely not the exception, but perhaps more the rule. And I look forward to future work that pursues a more of an integration between these uh, language-based networks and emotion perception work like I showed you. So now I'm going to do a bit of a pivot uh, for the second part of the talk. Um, really given these findings of conceptual diversity that we see at the societal level, we might also expect to see similar variation at the individual level. And this should track with emotion perception if it is the case that emotion perception is a culturally constructed phenomenon. That is, um, this is intercultural variation in construction that I'm turning to next. Here, we want to ask whether individual differences in the concepts that individuals have access to and use is going to impact their ability to perceive emotion um, in a manner that's in sync with their cultural group. Before I get to my own um, research in this uh, line of work, I wanted to give you uh, another great example of some elegant work that's been done recently um, testing this same idea. So in this research, um, participants were first given a conceptual similarity task. So uh, in the task, participants were given emotion labels and then uh, sets of features. And they were asked to rate the extent to which those features, so um, the feature could be a facial behavior, um, a body state, and so on. And they rated the extent to which those features uh, corresponded to the emotion category. Then what the researchers did was they looked at the distance between these uh, emotion categories pairwise. And so what you can see here is a, a map of the conceptual distance between um, emotions like disgust and anger, for example. In addition to this, uh, the participants also did emotion perception tasks. And here what I'm showing you is a task that used mouse tracking to try to get at category um, judgments and the degree of conflict or overlap between these categories. So participants were given a facial cue and then were asked to uh, indicate which of two categories that face corresponded to. For example, was that individual experiencing disgust or anger? And uh, what the task does is it starts the mouse off at the bottom of the screen and individuals move the cursor or the mouse to the category label that applies. And what's interesting here is that the arc in that um, mouse trajectory can reflect the degree of conflict between these two categories, such that uh, individuals who are um, uh, having a more difficult time selecting between the two category labels will have a wider arc in their mouse, mouse trajectory. I think what's quite compelling here is that uh, conceptual similarity, so in this conceptual similarity task, uh, 
within an individual is also predictive of emotion perception conflict. So individuals who perceived uh, anger and disgust as more similar would also have more difficulty in making this uh, distinction between the two um, target labels. So in my own work, um, I'll describe now, simil similar to Brooks and colleagues, we wanted to examine how learned concepts impact emotion perception. And we built on this uh, type of work in three distinct ways. So first, we were interested in assessing emotion perception as it dynamically unfolds. So uh, a common dissatisfaction, which I share about a lot of the research that um, I've been discussing so far, is that it's based on these isolated still frame cues that are already um, identified for your participant. And this doesn't have a lot of ecological validity when we think about the enormous amount of skill it takes to even identify um, these cues in the first place in everyday life. So first, we are interested in assessing emotion perception um, in this more dynamic context. And recent work has um, been making great headway in studying the dynamics of these types of perceptions. So for example, um, work has looked at how individuals dynamically label and parse emotional and non-emotional videos. And we borrow aspects of our paradigm from this prior work. For example, in the uh, event segmentation literature, there are individual differences in how finely grained indi individuals will segment the action of others. And these boundaries um, that individuals place between actions um, can predict subsequent memory for those events, suggesting that these are consequential um, uh, event boundaries that individuals are perceiving. We also wanted to quantify uh, synchrony rather than researcher stipulated accuracy. So in this way, we're building on approaches from the empathic accuracy literature where agreement between subjects serves as the primary metric of interest rather than some stipulated um, accuracy that's based on um, theoretically um, defined configurations, for example, of facial expressions. And then finally, we wanted to assess active emotion vocabulary use. So recent research suggests that there may actually be downsides to having a very productive emotion vocabulary. Individuals um, in uh, diary type posts or in blogs who tend to use more emotion uh, category labels and have a more diverse range of emotion category labels in their active emotion vocabulary actually uh, appear to have more maladaptive outcomes. But one way that we can look at this is that this may relate to the degree of emotionality more generally. So I'm very interested in whether the ability to predict um, or sorry, perceive emotions in other individuals in this more dynamic fashion might actually be aided by um, having a broader active emotion vocabulary, suggesting that there are upsides to um, having a more diverse set of terms that you actively use and have in your um, linguistic repertoire. So the place that we started um, in this research is um, really building on one of America's favorite pastimes, which is going to the movies. And in particular, what we're doing in this research is looking at how individuals are perceiving emotion in film clips. In recently published research that was led by uh, Tuan Lamau, um, that I collaborated on, we find that portrayals of emotion by actors are surprisingly variable and complex, rather than these sort of fixed stereotypes like the ones that I've been showing you up to this point. And this suggests that film may actually provide fertile ground for examining emotion perception from dynamic and complex cues. So in this work, we developed a paradigm to study emotion segmentation dynamics by allowing participants to view a film clip and then pause it when they observed a change in the target's emotional state. And we selected six clips that optimized the complexity of emotion dynamics over time. Um, we did this by mining um, existing data from uh, that Chen and Whitney paper that I mentioned, as well as searching for additional film clips and piloting them within lab. Um, I will tell you that there is a small limit to the generalizability of the types of clips that we used because when you tend to try to find clips that have a lot of 
intense emotional dynamics to them, they tend to be in romantic dyads. So um, flipping between fiery exchanges to, you know, long um, glances and, you know, positive affect. And so these are the types of clips that um, ended up sort of rising to the top of the heap for this initial study. So uh, we had 222 participants um, con complete this task, as well as some other measures. And I'm just going to give you a oops, quick sense of what the task is like. Um, this is on mute, so you're not missing any audio. So this would be a pretty aggressive segmenter um, that we're viewing here. Okay. So we have two primary hypotheses um, about performance in this task. So one is that there would be variation um, in the ability to segment emotions in a manner that's kind of in sync with other members of your cultural group. And second, the segmentation should track with an individual's active emotion vocabulary. And I'll break down how we operationalized um, that in a moment. So first to quantify performance, we assessed uh, how synchronously individuals segmented uh, videos using a tool called SegMag. And SegMag, uh, what it does is uh, compute a metric called segmentation magnitude here. And segmentation magnitude is um, generated as the sum of Gaussian distributions that are placed on top of the point at which an individual um, indicated there was an emotional event. And these Gaussian distributions are summed up and ones that are really exceeding what would be expected based on um, just random uh, placement of those uh, emotional points are deemed consensus events. So events that um, individuals within the sample are agreeing upon. We then uh, took these consensus events and we identified the boundaries um, for the start and the end of those events. And we quantified the extent to which a given participant um, placed a, a event marker within that event. So uh, the consensus event agreement metric that I'll refer to um, captures whether individuals identify these um, emotional events in a way that agrees with the group consensus. That is how in sync is their segmentation with the group. Um, because this is a little bit complex, I just want to pause if there are any clarifying questions about how this was put together. And I'm happy to expand on it later in the Q&A as well. OK, crystal clear, love it. OK, so um, what we did uh, next was um, look at the distribution of performance on this metric. And, oh, sorry, these are the group consensus events that you can see. And um, what we find is that there are pretty robust individual differences um, in an individual's ability to identify emotion in consensus with the group. So some individuals are doing quite well at this task and other individuals are extremely poor. Um, one thing that we did want to do before we moved on with this metric was check to see whether it had a reasonable convergent validity with existing measures. So we did compare this uh, segmentation metric to performance from a well-validated um, task that has good psychometrics that measures emotion perception from uh, multimodal cues um, that are presented in a single trial-based fashion. Um, this this uh, metric is um, from the GERT. And what we see is that they are um, uh, moderately related, suggesting that we are tapping um, emotion perception in a way that's sort of shared, um, a shared skill across these styles of tasks. And so what we wanted to do next is uh, see the extent to which this related to individuals' active emotion vocabulary. Um, so we, we seem to have support for this first uh, confirmation that this task seems to tap um, an individual's ability to segment emotions um, in a synchronous manner with other individuals. To uh, assess an individual's active emotion vocabulary, um, here what we needed to do was 
uh, to take very messy data and try to distill it down into a set of metrics that are going to reflect an individual's skill at um, providing labels that um, both are complex, um, diverse, and that match the group, broadly speaking. So we did this with three different metrics. Um, first, we just did a sort of counting up of the number of unique labels that individuals provided. And so this tells us something about the lex lexical variety of words generated by a participant. And this really maps onto that um, uh, previous literature I was mentioning about individuals' active emotion vocabulary. In addition, we looked at um, the average age of acquisition for the terms that individuals were generating. So is it the case that individuals are generating words like mad and sad, which tend to have very early um, acquisition or more complex terms that would um, emerge over time, words like awe um, that are coming online later. And then finally, we computed a novel metric that we refer to as the semantic agreement score. And here, what we're trying to quantify is agreement between the meaning of the label that a participant provided and the group consensus on what that um, same event means. So what we did was we took uh, individuals' labels and we looked at the loading of those particular words they generated within um, a word embedding space called affect vec. And what affect vec gives you is um, the degree of uh, sort of semantic proximity between a given word like mad and a set of category labels. What we did was we looked at a subset of um, 13 emotion categories that we thought captured the broad range of different um, emotions that individuals might be perceiving in these um, target clips. And we computed essentially a vector across um, each event to capture the group consensus meaning. So I'll show you a visualization of this to make it a little bit more clear. Um, and what we're doing is just within the um, identified events, um, as I referred to earlier, those consensus events. So here is actually a plot that shows all of the consensus events um, for this task across videos. And on the um, X axis here, we have emotions arrayed. So one thing that might be popping out to you pretty um, immediately is that um, there's a lot of anger being expressed in these uh, clips. So across um, many of the events, anger was, um, were words that are close, uh, kind of semantic, close semantically to the word anger um, are being used by participants. Um, but we can also see that for a given clip, right, the profile is going to vary um, in that group consensus labeling. So in some cases, there were multiple emotions that were sort of um, relatively high in their waiting for a particular event. Then what we can do is we can look at how distant an individual's label or set of labels they provided for that event are to this group consensus. And that's our measure that we will um, derive of semantic agreement. So before we move on, I just wanna make sure if there are any clarifying questions that folks have about the way that this was calculated. So it's a little bit complex, but it's a way to automate this process and um, get away from the need to do this um, in a way that relies on human perceivers to judge similarity. Okay. So, um, Without further ado, um, these are the primary findings um, from this um, study. And what we can see is that um, here uh, for each of these plots, we're looking at um, performance um, on this task as indexed by that consensus event agreement. And then we're looking at these three different measures of an individual's active emotion um, vocabulary on um, the X axis. And what we can see is that across these different metrics, uh, individuals who have um, more productive emotion vocabularies, who use emotion terms in a way that agrees with the group, and who use uh, terms that are going to be later acquired in development, tend to be performing better at this task. And so what this suggests is that um, 
we can support our second prediction, which is that segmentation is tracking with an individual's active emotion vocabulary. So to summarize this uh, study, what we've found uh, so far is that individuals are varying in the extent to which their emotion perception is converging with other members of their cultural group. And that this skill is related to the words that individuals can produce, suggesting that the dynamics of emotion perception and emotion knowledge um, that those uh, terms are tapping are linked to emotion perception. So these are, um, you know, quite preliminary findings, but we're we're very excited about them. And I think um, what uh, is also quite interesting to think about is what else we would want to explore with data like these. For example, uh, one of the um, really interesting aspects of um, emotion knowledge is that it is a heavily socialized domain. So um, early in development, this is really considered to be a critical period for developing a mental model for emotion that allows an individual to engage in regulation of their own body in a culturally fitting manner. So for example, the prevalence of joint attention in the social dyad within the first year of life predicts the degree to which that child uses emotion language later on. Further, we know that the caregiver use of emotion language also predicts the child's budding emotion vocabulary. And this is often um, based on when the caregiver is actually labeling uh, the infant or the child's internal state for them as a way to sort of teach this um, uh, process. So it's also possible that um, this is a very flexible capacity and something that can be improved into adulthood with training. And so it'll be interesting to know whether training on emotion concepts um, actually can shape performance on tasks like the one I just showed you. That is, can individuals actually improve in this capacity if we specifically target um, what we think of as the sort of special ingredients, right, emotion concepts. Uh, in addition, we do not really know how this skill um, that we're assessing in this task is related to other forms of emotion complexity. So in some of the other work that I've done, I've focused on a construct uh, termed emotional granularity or emotion differentiation. And this is really about the um, ability that individuals have to apply labels either to their own experience or to others um, in a way that's precise. And what we know is that this varies um, across the general population, although uh, emotional granularity um, is implicated in various forms of psychopathology and dysregulation. And individuals who are high in emotional granularity or differentiation will use um, words in a specific way, meaning that um, when they uh, apply that label to their own state or to others, will do so in a way that the emotion words are not correlated over time. That is, they're using them with high information. Other individuals, um, in contrast, are doing something more like these green circles here and using words in a very uh, correlated way over time, suggesting that they don't have precise meanings that they're reflecting. Um, and as a result, uh, even if they endorse an emotion, they may be using it in a low information way. So future work will really be necessary to see whether granularity um, as measured in the ways that I've described um, is predictive of emotion segmentation ability and to what extent, or if these can be considered uh, somewhat distinct uh, capacities. Zooming out, uh, I think the research that I've presented today suggests that increasing diversity in samples, as well as um, in methods used to assess emotion perception can reveal aspects of its culturally constructed basis that otherwise would not be apparent. Um, but these studies also do not go far enough um, in the sense that systems of non-diversity intersect. Um, and our research should really aim to address uh, these dimensions simultaneously to really build robust insights about phenomena, including emotions. And I think if we can do so, we'll bolster our ability to uh, more robustly and perhaps more ethically apply emotion science um, to these uh, applied domains that we started with. So to end, I wanted to uh, just spend a moment to acknowledge the many people I collaborate with 
who made this research possible, um, as well as my wonderful lab. Um, so we, we did a pumpkin picking uh, event outdoors uh, this fall, which was very fun. Not everyone is pictured there, but you can see us with our proud, uh, yeah, proudly displaying our pumpkins that we picked. <laughs> um, so I just also wanted to uh, thank you all for your attention. I know that uh, Zoom uh, lectures are not the easiest to stay engaged with and um, follow along. So I really appreciate you sticking with me here. And I hope if there are any questions that came up um, that I'm able to answer them. I'm looking forward to some discussion. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, so yeah, in order to, uh, to handle the uh, 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 questions, um, if you could use the, uh, the hand raising function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen under reactions in order to uh, raise your hand and that'll move you to the front of the queue and then I can uh, uh, call on you uh, in that order. Uh, so while everybody is sort of uh, figuring out where their hand raise function is and getting their thoughts organized, I just asked a, a quick uh, uh, question here that you were you you were about the uh, the Hadza research. Um, you know, a part of it you didn't discuss was that uh, uh, you were contrasting uh, the emotion states versus other forms of affect, affective uh, perception. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit what what you mean by that or what those tasks are. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, maybe what I'll do is try to pull up, have some figures tucked away here. Um, so one of the things that's quite interesting about a lot of the tasks that have this kind of embedded structure in them um, is that uh, one source of structure is the choices that you provide individuals. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but I'll step you through it. Um, so. We, in addition to the free labeling um, task that I described, we also gave participants um, a more classic um, choice from array task. They were given um, scenarios like the ones I described earlier, but what we did was we manipulated the foils that uh, individuals were given on, it, on a trial. And what this allows us to do is to try to disentangle um, perceptions that are really driven by um, broader features, um, which uh, here we're disentangling our valence and arousal. So um, by way of example, so here um, in this trial type, the scenario would be his or her friends have come and she or he is very happy. And then um, we would give them two uh, faces. So the target face would be this one here on the right-hand side, which is you know, smiling, portraying happiness. Um, and then the um, foil face uh, would be drawn um, from a category that differs in both valence and arousal, meaning that this is a lower arousal face, there's less kind of energy um, uh, that it's depicting as well as a negative face. And so we predicted that this would be uh, really the sort of easiest uh, type of trial for individuals to undertake because you can use these broader dimensions to solve the task. Um, we, we then did this um, for arousal and valence separately. So here, um, what we have is um, two faces that are not controlled for arousal, but they're differing in valence. And so the individual um, on, on this trial um, would have to select between um, faces that are um, varying uh, on this um, dimension. Um, for the uh, valence controlled here, the faces are both negative, um, but what we can see is that um, they're varying in that arousal dimension. And then finally, um, we have this affect controlled condition. And this is the sort of tightest controlled condition that allows us to look at um, what we think of as emotion perception um, in this more categorical sense. So individuals cannot use these other dimensions um, of balance and arousal to solve the task. So uh, when we look at a task like this, um, what we see is that um, American participants are largely insensitive actually to these kinds of manipulations. So they're doing quite well across these different trials. Our Hadza participants are much more variable and in general are performing um, very well on these affect controlled um, and even arousal controlled and valence controlled trials. 
um, their performance is the lowest as we predicted in this affect controlled trial. Um, now you'll note that participants are still um, above chance level performance here. And this is in part because there are these heavy contextual cues aside from, or we think in part because there are these heavy contextual cues aside from emotion that are present in the task. So for example, um, someone encountering rotten meat, right? And then you would um, encounter an expression that's varying. Um, in some cases, uh, the target might look like they're smelling something. And so there's a sort of complexity to that interpretation um, in the sense that um, they may be um, perceiving that person as disgusted or they may be matching a behavior to the context, right? So the person is smelling something rotten, right? And that fits with the context. So this really needs to get ferreted out with careful experimentation. Um, but what we can show here is that certainly affective information is really driving these types of perceptions. Um, when we did also um, constrain this, where we looked um, specifically at our participants that um, had less uh, second language usage self-reported, um, we see that overall performance in this affect controlled condition is lower. Um, and this may suggest that there is some, uh, you know, um, use of Swahili might be predicting actually this sort of um, a, a proxy for cultural exposure that is predicting um, performance in this condition. We have to be cautious about over-interpreting that. So hopefully that was a little bit of a long winded. I got to present a whole additional study, but hopefully that clarified, um, yeah, how we're, how we're trying to deal with this question of what those underlying dimensions are that might be driving behavior. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that was great. And it must be a lot of fun getting all that out into the field uh, <laughs> while they collect the data. Um, yeah, I think um, a, a lot of, um, you know, logistic challenges, but but joy that it, uh, you know, accompanies it. So. Sounds good. Um, please uh, feel free to, to raise your hand. Uh, Arbor. Hey, so I have two questions, uh, the smaller of which is relevant to these data that you just showed. So you, you've given us, I think, uh, a number of pieces of findings showing that you are getting uh, cross-cultural variants at the sort of interpretive level. But say you were to like borrow some of these like disgust inducing tasks like spring fart spray, for example, do you imagine that at the level of production you would get similarities? I guess my bigger question is, are there any tasks in the space of emotion where you would expect similarities? Because I guess one challenge in such cross-cultural comparisons is, will you just always get variants in, no matter what the task is among the Hatza, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, the question of production is a challenging one only because um, the base rates of these behaviors are quite low, even within you know a US cultural context. So if you, you know, spray the fart spray, uh, you, you might get the kind of canonical disgust expression, you may not. Um, but I do think uh, it's, it's worthwhile to do those studies. I have a colleague, um, uh, Carlos Crivelli, um, who's independently done a lot of work um, in small scale societal contexts, again, trying to tackle these questions of um, uh, how much sort of facial behavior is really signaling the same thing, um, how much it might be conveying motives and so forth. Um, and he's done some tasks where he's tried to elicit emotion and looked at nonverbal behavior. Um, in general, my understanding, I don't think he hasn't published his work yet, is that um, the uh, sort of expressive production is, is not kind of fitting with these, these you know, expectations of these you know, canonical expressions, but we'll have to see what his data show when he actually does come to press with it. Um, I think for me, you know, this, this question really connects to even a bigger hole in the literature, which is that we start with these style faces um, and then we look for, you know, uh, perception of them that, that matches the, um, you know, North American and uh, U.S. expectations for how um, these perceptions should unfold. Um, but we're doing relatively less of the very data-driven um, quantification of, so, you know, how are people moving their faces? Um, are there variable expressive forms that we can identify um, and, and productively use in tasks like this? Um, I will say in this um, research, we found um, 
a lot of use of behavior language, um, but much less use of mental state language more generally. So uh, sometimes people would use um, terms to refer to broad affective states, but often they would um, talk about what someone was doing. So uh, they're going to get in a fight maybe, or um, they feel sick, right? So, so various kinds of um, embedded behaviors and contexts. Um, and I think this uh, is really interesting because, you know, one question is, is this really just because we're giving the wrong stimuli, right? So maybe, maybe the um, uh, mental state language that we're not eliciting is really because we're not providing the right cues. Um, after this study, we actually went back and we did an interview study with uh, 93 community members where we asked them to, um, talk about everyday experiences of an emotion. And of course, there are huge caveats to trying to get people to talk about emotions. Um, but what we saw there was, again, um, a very kind of limited repertoire of um, mental state category labels that came up, suggesting that it's at least not the faces, right, as a means of probing this system that was limited. Um, but what we did see was, um, again, a lot of situated behavior. Right, that, that um, in some cases was very similar um, across individuals. So I think it's a great question. It's work that needs to be done. Uh, this is a very short answer. Um, and uh, I, I hope that you know, we can productively use um, tasks as you, as you mentioned within the um, emotion literature, but also perhaps utilize um, methods that are going to get at more naturalistic facial behavior, right? So as the sort of computer vision techniques um, can start doing things that are less supervised, I think we'll um, get closer to being able to just answer these questions um, in a more data-driven way as well. Philippe, have you ever had yeah. this? Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna have a very simple question. Uh, could you come up with a definition of emotion? I, I think that this is um, the simplest and the hardest question you could ask me actually. Um, and, you know, in the emotion literature, what's often um, uh, used as the basis for definition is to list off properties, right? So emotions are, um, states that involve some degree of physiological activation, um, uh, coordinated with behavior, um, they involve uh, expressive facial movements, they have um, changes in uh, our subjective state, right, so feeling um, uh, feelings of pleasure or displeasure with some degree of arousal. So I could give you a kind of standard answer like that, um, and I think that that does help us to define the space of what it is that we're talking about. Um, but I think the tension here is that actually not all uh, communities have a, a category, an overarching kind of category for emotion, and um, that the features that are used to um, identify emotion as a distinct domain um, vary. That said, if you if you think about defining emotion based on um, perceiver consensus, I think you can um, get pretty far. So there's classic work for you know, English language um, emotion categories from the 1980s, um, where you get pretty remarkable consensus across individuals in terms of rating whether a, a given term um, can be considered an emotion or not. So I, I think that this is, um, uh, certainly a domain where um, affect, right, so the, the sort of changes to um, one's uh, subjective experience, right, that are sort of um, shifts in pleasure, right, or displeasure, or um, physiological engagement are often characteristic, but they're not necessary or sufficient features, perhaps, um, for defining the domain. So uh, I, perhaps a bit of a non-answer, but I hope at least uh, lets you into my thinking about this. But the, the point is, is that uh, the etymology of the words uh, comes mm -hmm. from moving out. So it's very much linked to the expression of mental states, mm -hmm. whatever they are, right? So in coming back to Arbor's question, I think uh, it's interesting that, you know, we, <clears throat> there's, there's a strong emphasis on the understanding of uh, 
and uh, the reception or categorization of emotion, uh, but it's somehow disconnected with the, the, the true meaning. I mean, the meaning that you find in the dictionary and that we're supposed to share regarding emotion. So there is some kind of an asymmetry here uh, that, I, that, that I noticed, that's all. Yeah, no, that's incredibly interesting. And I think this, this point about kind of expressivity as, as one way to define the domain is really up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shlomit, are you manually raising your hand there? Uh, you're still muted. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure on my uh, screen where to uh, use the other feature. So first of all, thank you very much. It, uh, uh, I decided not to ask questions today because it was so thought provoking that I have a list of things that uh, I would enjoy very much to discuss. But Philippe's question uh, forces me to uh, bring up one of the thoughts that I have. Damasio makes this distinction between feelings and emotions. And he speaks about emotions as being the automatic part of the process preceding our conscious experience of whatever takes place. Uh, so I think that by matching what you call emotion with semantics, it's more what Damasio I think would call feelings. And one thing that uh, I don't know if we have even any way to, to empirically study it, maybe with some ERP techniques or stuff like that is are we responding or perceiving, if we for a moment adopt Damasio's definition, are we uh, responding to the emotions? In other words, the person who experiences it has not yet defined it or only after the person can really label it as feelings, giving it the semantic label. And this is what causes the expression you spoke mainly about facial expressions. I think prosody also should be taken into account and might um, relate to some of the non-universal aspect that you showed. So I just wanted to add this to Philippe's question about definitions. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I think to, to some extent, some, I think there's debate, right, about where that, that nonverbal behavior is coming from. Um, to some extent, some of it, is likely going to be um, driven by sort of the Damasio's um, emotions, right? So this very, I would think of as kind of affective, right? So driven um, in, in a much more automatic way um, by changes um, in physiology, but that it's much less structured, right? Than the kind of signaling that we're studying in a lot of these tasks. Um, there's interesting work, uh, meta-analytic work looking at um, emotion perception and um, if you have individuals, um, so, so there's studies where you have individuals portray emotion um, or um, sort of it, it imagine situations, right? And, and emotional expressions are recorded. And then these are used as stimuli um, in studies. And in general, um, it's individuals from societies that are really historically heterogeneous, um, which are producing these kinds of expressions that are very uh, kind of stereotyped, right? And elicit these very clear categorical responses from uh, individuals from other societies. And so, you know, one could argue then that there's sort of this um, expressive repertoire, right? That is really culturally conditioned and um, encouraged, um, but that that isn't the, the full scope, right? Of um, emotional uh, expressivity. So I think it's an excellent question. Um, there is some work, there's two studies that I know of that have actually looked at um, the sort of generation of um, emotional, like nonverbal behavior um, in imaging contexts. Um, so some work uh, by uh, Jamil Zaki and colleagues, and um, they do uh, suggest that um, nonverbal behavior can have sort of multiple patterns of generation. So some that might be um, much more sort of um, representing the other, right, and um, expressive in nature, and some that may be um, much more linked to the sort of ebb and flow of affect. So I think it's a great question um, that, that more work um, is necessary to pursue, but I think there are some interesting data points on it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And I see uh, Harold, do you have your hand up? I, I do. Can, can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really great and just so, so interesting. Just a, first a, a comment. Do you, isn't it kind of interesting how emotional people get when the, the topic of emotions is in play? And I, I wonder why that is, but but that that's just kind of he, neither here nor there. I I wonder if the questions and the approaches that you've used it in your research would yield somewhat similar results if the category that was used in terms of stimuli was something like colors. Wouldn't w might not experience with colors and the vocabulary used result in somewhat similar kinds of results. And if that's the case, then is there anything special about emotions? Or, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, wonderful question. I think, so um, number one, I, uh, I agree, affective scientists are an affective bunch, so it's, it's fun. <laughs> um, but the, the point about whether there's really something special about the way that language plays a role in emotion, I think is a really interesting one. Um, certainly there are studies right, that have done uh, very similar types of um, investigations of how language constrains um, emotion perception and color perception, for example. Um, so my, my former collaborator um, that I did some work uh, in Namibia with, um, uh, Debbie Robertson has, has done studies like this to try to um, look at really similarity in the way that um, emotion allows you to carve up both domains. So I do think that there is something um, quite similar, right, in terms of um, emotions allowing us to impose this um, sort of categorical structure. That said, I think emotion concepts are um, a different animal uh, than uh, color concepts in the sense that they are uh, very multimodal, um, that they probably have um, much more complex situated instances. So I think that they're, oh, well, I don't, I'm actually not a specialist in color, um, so, so perhaps I'm overstating this, but um, that the um, instantiation of an emotion like anger across uh, different contexts can be really widely varying. So um, think about anger right in the context of the workplace and the features that you would bring online right to predict um, uh, you know uh, what what anger looks like in someone else or or even how anger should um, occur in yourself that's going to be quite different than you know anger on the road right an instance of someone cuts you off when driving right the, the behavioral repertoire is going to be quite different and so forth. So I do think um, because emotion categories are much more complex um, and they have this uh, amount of um, abstraction, right? That is um, probably also varying quite a bit across people. There's um, potentially more variability in terms of how it constrains the domain. Um, and, and so I think that's interesting, right? And something that we can um, try to learn more about and you know, presumably, um, train concepts are in a way that can improve functioning in the emotion domain. But I, I agree that there's um, aspects to the sort of um, way that the mind works in a predictive manner and the way that uh, language serves as a top-down constraint that really should be shared across um, any sort of perceptual domain. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Arbor? I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to jump in because Harold oh. raised a point that was on my mind throughout the talk. And, and I also have to ask this too, as a former member of your current department, and I interact with Brian Scholl a lot. So I'm going to ask you a Brian Scholl question, <laughs> especially given that we were just primed with uh, the, the case of colors. Do you think this is perception? I think that the tasks that I, the task I presented today um, doesn't necessarily speak to perception, right? So it's a, it's a task that's assessing categorization. So I'm using perception in the sort of big way that emo, uh, social psychologists use it. 
Um, I do, there is a little bit of data that suggests that there may be um, more perception like effects happening here. So um, a paper uh, that I uh, was the lead on uh, back in the early 2010s, we uh, used semantic satiation to try to make emotion concepts less accessible. So people would repeat a word like anger 30 times. Um, and then we gave them a perceptual priming task. So um, participants saw under the refractory period of satiation an expression like the ones I've shown you today. So a scowling face. Um, and then um, later on in the trial, after that refractory period has kind of loosened, um, we presented that face again. And we gave participants a purely perceptual judgment, which was to judge how close together or far apart the eyes were. So something that should be independent of emotion. Um, and what we see is that satiation did impact um, that perceptual priming effect. So participants were slowed to respond to that face a second time when they were satiated with the relevant label. Um, it's possible, right, that there's uh, some sort of interference effect present, um, but that's the closest that we've gotten behaviorally to trying to answer this question. Um, there is also uh, a follow-up paper. So I talked about um, Brooks and Freeman's um, 2018 paper. They have a um, follow-up paper that was published um, in 2019 where they um, did neuroimaging as well. And they showed participants um, uh, faces in the scanner. And so this is not looking at sort of active emotion language use, but just sort of how the um, structure of someone's concept knowledge might shape um, the representations. And what they find is that the right fusiform gyrus um, is actually uh, the sort of um, how distinct the representations of a, a face um, for anger, right, or a face portraying disgust, how distinct that representation is, um, is tracking with this um, uh, conceptual similarity task. Um, so I think that that's it's not, you know, V1, and I don't think that we would necessarily expect effects there, but I think that there is evidence to suggest that um, there are these um, uh, sort of lower level um, perception differences as well. Um, to some extent, I, I don't think it matters a whole lot in the sense that um, we know that there are um, uh, memory biases that come online as well, right? So just giving someone um, a word when they're encoding a target um, leads them to sort of distort their perceptual memory. We know that, so the, the attentional effects and the sort of in, encoding and memory effects are really robust there too, and have a lot of explanatory value, I think, in understanding how language is constraining this domain, even without those very low level perception effects. But it's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, something, we need more data um, on that particular front. Um, but I think uh, when we're thinking about emotion perception more broadly um, in terms of this skill of being able to sort of identify instances and, um, uh, you know, understand them in a sort of group consensus like way, um, then, you know, concepts and um, the active emotion vocabulary seems really important. All right. Well, thank you very much. We've already uh, kept you uh, 20 minutes past the hour. So uh, we very much appreciate the talk and, uh, you know, all the answers to the questions. And uh, hopefully we can get you here in, in person sometime soon. I would love that. It's been great to connect with everyone. And thank you for the uh, huge compliment of these amazing questions. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you.